by the six colleges. My name is Emily Almas, and I'm the Director of Admissions at Bowdoin College. I'm joined by my colleagues at Amherst College, Carleton College, Pomona College, Swarthmore College, and Williams College. First, let's allow them to introduce themselves. From Amherst College. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Zolkis, Dean of Admission at Amherst. Welcome. It's great to have you joining us. From Carleton College. Hi everyone, my name is Adam Webster. I'm the Director of Admissions at Carleton in Minnesota. From Pomona College. Good evening everyone, my name is Joel Hart. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Admissions and Director of Operations at Pomona College in Claremont, California. From Swarthmore College. Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Moe, Director of Admissions here at Swarthmore College in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. And from Williams College. Hi everyone, my name is Solgi Lim. I'm the Director of Admission at Williams College in Williamstown, Mass. So great to be here. We're excited to talk to you tonight. Yes, thank you for joining us. We know that there's a lot going on in the world right now, today and generally. So we hope that you and your family are doing well. And we appreciate that you took some time to spend it with us this evening or whatever time or hour it may be where you are. As we get started, know that closed captioning is available by selecting the closed captioning option. Maybe you're just beginning your college search with our program today. Maybe you're already well underway on your journey. Wherever you may be along the college admissions process, we're here to help. Typically, this group of six colleges is a pretty modest one. But today, today we're going to brag a little bit and make the bold claim that our six colleges are among the very best schools that you could attend anywhere in the world. After we talk a little bit through why a liberal arts college like one of ours might be the right choice for you, we'll walk through the college search process. And of course, there'll be plenty of time for your questions. On that note, if you have a question, make sure to use the Q&A function on your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can, and we ask that your questions are more general in nature. If you have a specific question for one of our colleges or we don't get the opportunity to get to your question, please feel free to reach out to any of our schools after this program. And of course, we'll also be recording this program so you can find it later on the six colleges website. So let's start off with a question of our own. Why choose a liberal arts college? I'm going to turn things over to Adam from Carleton College. Okay, let's start with some basics. Uh, our schools specialize in providing a first rate undergraduate education. Our resources are dedicated to educating 18 to 22 year olds, ensuring that they thrive during their time in college. And we're preparing them to be leaders when they're ready to launch out into the world beyond college. It is the reason we exist. Whether it's our teaching driven professors, our updated facilities like libraries, laboratories, and music practice rooms, or resources like counseling services or our career centers, everything and everyone at these institutions is committed to providing an exceptional undergraduate experience. This takes commitment and focus but it also takes investment. As a collection of colleges, we're fortunate to have the financial resources that allow us to spend more dollars per undergraduate student each year than nearly any other college or university in the country. As a model of higher education, this is an enormous opportunity and enormous responsibility, and it is globally distinct. Our financial resources allow us to build academic programs that are equally strong across the board, from the artsiest arts all the way to the stemmiest stems. We keep our classrooms small and we offer exceptional financial support that helps our students dream big. At our schools, you can focus on being a student because undergraduate education is what we do really, really well. So here's another question for you. Aren't liberal arts colleges small? For that, I'm going to turn to Selby from Williams. Absolutely. We absolutely are small, and we think there's uh, something really special about our size combined with the tremendous resources that we have um, and that Adam mentioned just now. Uh, our campuses are intentionally small, uh, they're diverse and residential, and at our schools, each student really matters. Just to give you a point of comparison, uh, you all may know UCLA, a very well-known public research university in California. UCLA enrolls over 30,000 undergraduate students. 
And at each of our schools, we have between 1,600 to 2,200 students in total. And we work incredibly hard in our respective admission offices to bring to our campuses students who have um, a really wide range of racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds, interests, and beliefs, and who come from many different places in the US and abroad to live and to learn and to make deep personal connections across differences during their time in college. Um, we think it's really important that this diversity within our student body um, enhances the learning experience for everyone. And we feel so lucky to have incredibly generous financial aid programs um, that hopefully make our schools affordable for students from all backgrounds, including those um, from families with fewer financial resources. Uh, we also believe that some of the most important lessons you'll learn in college will actually take place outside of the classroom. At our schools, learning starts in the classroom uh, and it continues. It continues as you share meals with professors in the dining halls uh, or have late night conversations with friends uh, in the dorm rooms. And you'll never ever just be a member. If you come to one of our schools, your experiences, uh, your perspective, uh, your voice will truly matter in and out of the classroom. And because of our strong reputations as academic institutions, we're able to attract faculty who are both world-class researchers in their fields and also outstanding teachers and educators. Our professors will have manageable teaching loads and teach in manageable classrooms, usually less than 20 students. Our professors are going to rely on you uh, as apprentice scholars, whether that's on a research project or an animated conversation during office hours. There are no teaching assistants or TAs here. Uh, and our professors uh, will want to get to know you as a real person. They're invested in your success in class and beyond, and, and they'll become part of your life to realize that. You'll see them at a dance performance, at an athletic, ev athletic event, or on Saturday morning at the local coffee shop. You'll probably stay in touch with them even after you graduate. Uh, so you've heard a little bit about our professors. Uh, we want to talk uh, about the curriculum now. So at our six schools, all of us structure curricula so that students are able to develop deep knowledge within their major, uh, but also get a, a broad educational foundation by taking courses in a number of different academic subjects across the humanities, the social sciences, and natural sciences. And as a result, our students over time become intellectually flexible. They're able to make connections across different subjects. They're able to examine topics and issues from multiple perspectives. And they become really excellent communicators across different subject areas. Uh, you might be asking, why is this useful? Uh, it's because our society's most pressing challenges uh, require leaders who can be um, flexible thinkers and bring together and lead teams of people who have different areas of expertise and who think differently. Um, we talked earlier about our schools being small. Uh, well, our classes are intentionally small too, uh, and they're more often than not taught in discussion or seminar format. Uh, in our world today, there's so much information readily available everywhere. Uh, but information is really just the starting point to truly understanding. And the challenge lies uh, in making sense of information, to make connections across seemingly disparate ideas, uh, and to understand complexity, uh, to have an informed opinion. And at our six colleges, you'll be asked your opinion in a computer science class, just as often as you will in an English class. And through this repeated practice of sharing your opinion, discussing ideas, hopefully uh, at times disagreeing with uh, your peers, you'll become uh, an even stronger critical thinker, even more uh, excellent communicator than you are now. Uh, and finally, I, I wanna make sure I talk about writing. At our schools, regardless of your major, you'll be doing a lot of writing and becoming an even stronger writer than you already are. So yeah, we've talked about how these are smaller institutions, and that's not just a pragmatic sort of function of a place that insists on smaller class sizes. Um, there's something about being a smaller institution that informs a shared culture that you'll find across our six schools. At each of our colleges, we foster collaborative learning, a spirited sense that we learn better together than apart. And certainly the last two years have really shown that, thrown that into sharp relief. 
Promoting collaborative campus climate is a shared responsibility and it is so, so important. Our students learn that their voices are and should be heard and that they have a critical role to play in solving tough problems, whether that's on a problem set or in the community at large. This breeds confidence to engage with rigorous learning and look out for the social and emotional well being of each and every member of our community. Uh, so you might be thinking, uh, that all sounds great, uh, but what can I do with a liberal arts education after I graduate? Um, and the answer really, without uh, being trying to be cliche, truly is anything. Uh, our goal uh, is to develop and equip our students to be ethical, thoughtful, and successful citizens and leaders in a wide range of fields. Um, as we talked about earlier, the world we live in is becoming increasingly fast paced, um, more interconnected, uh, complex and unpredictable. And the curricula at our six schools um, are not pre-professional or vocation oriented, uh, but at each of our schools, we have tremendous career center resources that are dedicated to helping our students identify their interests, their strengths, to explore career opportunities, and to launch into a wide range of careers afterward. Uh, we also have, due to our small size and close-knit communities, incredibly loyal alumni who want to help our students succeed in their respective fields and who regularly offer internship and job opportunities. And as a result, within six months of graduation, nearly all of our graduates are employed in graduate school or pursuing service opportunities. And finally, uh, we constantly refine what we do. My colleagues have heard me say this over the years, but one of the very best parts of working at our institutions is that we are genuinely responsive to the needs of our students. We constantly center and then recenter our curriculum and co-curriculum in the high impact practices that deliver the best outcomes to the members of our community. Now, these high impact practices are numerous, so I'll just list a few here. Um, there's a reason we all insist on robust first year seminars, that we mandate writing intensive coursework across the curriculum, and ask all of our students to do hands-on research. Similarly, it shouldn't surprise you that we lean into collaborative project work and expect growing global awareness and cultural competencies from all members of our communities. Whatever we do, we do for a reason. Our data shows that it makes you a better student, community member, and paves the way to the life you want to lead. Thanks, Adam and Solgi. So we've spent a good portion so far talking about why liberal arts colleges like ours might be the right choice for many students. But how do you get started on the college search process? Where do you even begin? Let's continue our exploration with that very question. How do I start my college search? We'll turn to Kate and to Joel. Thank you. So it's no secret that the college search process can be stressful. Collectively, between the six of us, we have a lot of experience. Consider this session kind of an insider knowledge. We want you to be successful in the college search process. But how do you navigate the search in a productive and informed way and at the same time maintain healthy relationships with your family and friends? Begin with being open-minded and adopt a willingness to ask yourself questions. Joel will share some helpful advice on what you might consider. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, I, I would say it, it's a process of knowing yourself that should help you to start identifying the pros and cons of a variety of different institutional types out there. Um, there are no good or bad schools, and, and so is there a way to condense the 4,000 colleges and universities in this country into a rank-ordered list um, that you could read about in, uh, let's say, a third-rate news magazine? That's not possible. So instead, think about college and the college search process as a series of trade-offs. Um, take size. You've already heard all of us extol the value of the small college experience, and obviously we truly believe in it. It means you get to bring your intellectual A game every single day. Uh, because after all, there's no back row in which to hide when you're sitting around a seminar table with 10 classmates and a professor. But there may be days in college when you want that back row that a larger institution would provide. Lectures aren't necessarily better or worse than seminars. They're just different. That's a trade-off. 
Uh, similarly, you may decide that you crave the hustle and bustle of an urban institution with everything that comes with that. And that may mean, however, you won't have the traditional campus space or the same kind of residential experience institutions like ours offer. Again, neither one is wrong, but they represent a trade-off. So as you take stock of who you are and what it means for you to feel a sense of belonging in a community next year, start translating that into the sorts of values you expect the institutions you explore to have. To ask yourself, how do I learn best? What sorts of relationships do I wanna have with the people who teach me? How do I envision living in community with my peers? What sort of diversity do I expect? Understand that no one place is perfect, nor is there any one school that is perfect for you. There are always going to be trade-offs. And part of what you'll spend the next year doing is assessing what's most important to you in your undergraduate home. Um, one area where we hope that you don't have to think about trade-offs is affordability. Uh, affordability is obviously an important topic as you begin looking ahead to the college search process. And so now is the time to start having honest conversations as a family about paying for college. What monies are available to you to finance your education? Do you have a college saving plan? Are there tuition benefits available through a parent's workplace? Do you have other siblings or who are in college or will be attending later? These are the types of questions you need to begin asking to determine what is a realistic amount your family can pay for your education. Knowing what your family's financial capabilities are can help you start narrowing down the schools you might consider. And so while it's important to have these conversations, it's also important to understand that the price you see on the window sticker, as it were, may not be the price you'd actually pay at any of our institutions. Institutions like ours are committed to keeping college affordable for our students and their families. That means most of our students aren't paying the full price of attendance. And so we help families meet their need through financial aid offerings. So I'm gonna give you a few basic terms to add to your dictionary as you start investigating colleges. You can use these terms to ask questions of the schools that you're considering. Um, roughly, colleges will divide their financial aid into two kinds, need-based aid, which is based on the family's financial circumstances, and merit-based aid, which might be awarded for a strong academic record or on the overall strength of your application. Many, but not all, colleges and universities offer merit scholarships. They may have a separate application, a different priority deadline. You'll have to investigate this for each school to which you're applying. Don't overlook local scholarships, too. Uh, your town's Rotary Club, for example, may offer a small scholarship that's just for local students for which you could apply. But need-based aid gets a little bit more complicated. An institution might say that it is need-blind or doesn't consider need. This means that a college doesn't consider whether you're applying for financial aid or how much aid you need when reviewing your application. The counterpoint to this, the flip side, is an institution that's need-aware, which means your family's need is, can affect your admissibility. Asking a school which kind they are is a great place to start. The kind of need-based aid that's available can vary. Uh, it might be grant money that's not expected to be repaid. It could include a packaged loan that you'll have to repay to a lender when you graduate. To get an idea of what's available to you at any particular school, look for a school's net price calculator on its website. This is a web tool that will allow you to plug in your family's income information and get an estimate of what you could expect to pay at that individual school. Uh, there's also a free website, myintuition.org, that partners with 70 plus private and public institutions to provide a quick six question financial aid estimate. That's a great place to start. Uh, Kate, I know has thoughts your investment in your education can lead to. Thanks, Joel. So here we are about talking about jumpstarting the college search process. And I'm gonna jump ahead even further to touch upon post-college outcomes. From the first week on our campuses, new students are encouraged and even incentivized to explore our career centers. A foundation of a liberal arts education, Solgi spoke of the set of deeper abilities to write effectively, argue persuasively and solve problems, adapt and learn. Employers value these skills. Adam shared that we invest our resources in helping students pursue career interests outside of the classroom. Our students expect to take advantage of summer internship opportunities over at least one summer and often more. We also mentioned that without graduate students, you are the singular focus. 
our faculty across the discipline are engaged in research and turn to our students to join in their research. So it's not at all unusual for our students to be co-authors with our faculty. Senior year, often our students elect to engage in their own original research in the form of a senior thesis. This makes our students top graduate school prospects and also top candidates for jobs. Okay, so what do you do next? Obviously, we're cognizant that it can still be hard to know how best to engage with the schools in which you're interested right now. Um, even as the world at large is, is reopening, institutions like ours might be taking a more cautious approach given the residential nature of our communities. Uh, we encourage you to use the resources you do have to get to know schools as much as you can. Um, that might mean sitting through a few more webinars, uh, but it also means that there are other opportunities you can investigate. You might find that an institution offers a virtual tour. Um, you might be able to connect with a current student for a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call. Take advantage of programs like this that allow you to hear from multiple schools once. Uh, and then as we all hopefully have more clarity in the summer and in the fall, we hope you'll be able to get out and see our beautiful campuses. Um, and I know Kate has some final thoughts on how to best set yourself up for success as you look ahead to the application process. Thanks, Joel. So while you're exploring colleges, both physically and virtually, you could also begin and just begin to think about what goes into the application process itself. I am not suggesting you start filling out an application today. The common application isn't even available till August, but you can begin to think about different parts of your application, such as teacher recommendations, counselor recommendations, class selection for the fall, and even essays. And I'll touch upon each of these very briefly. So let's start with teacher recommendations. We read teacher recommendations closely. They tell us a lot about you in the context of the classroom. Are you engaged? Do you ask questions that suggest a sense of curiosity? When the material becomes challenging, do you seek help and advice from your teachers? Here's a side note, we're reassured when you do. Um, think about which teachers might be able to give give us the best insight into the full range of you as a student. It may not be the teacher from whom you earned an easy A. In fact, if you found a class challenging and demonstrated tenacity and an outstanding worth, work ethic in order to earn a grade that reflects your effort, that teacher might be a really good candidate to write your letter. Let the teacher know also why you're asking them to write the letter of recommendation. Was there a specific moment in class that you can share with the teacher that might be helpful in writing that letter? They will be much more receptive and enthusiastic about writing a letter if you ask them well before the deadline. Counselor evaluations can lend additional perspective also to an applicant, although increasingly some counselors are unable to write letters of, of support because their caseloads are too large. If this is your case, worry not, we have your teacher recommendations. However, if your counselor is able to write on your behalf, make sure they know who you are. Introduce yourself and share your interests with them. If there's a blemish on your academic record, the counselor is a good person to put that in context. By the time some students start their senior year, they've completed many of their graduation requirements as, as far as classes go. However, you should continue to take advantage of classes in the core subject areas. So those are English, math, science, history, and language. Counselors are asked to rate their students' curricular choice ranging from below average to most demanding. So what you should not do is you should not let up and coast senior year. We will notice either in selecting your classes or in your academic performance. Essays. So essays can be a source of anxiety. While they're an important part of the application, let me just reassure you that very few essays get a student into college and very few essays keep a student out. Most add another layer to the application and demonstrate a student's ability to write analytically. A good essay takes time and takes revisions, it is often a response to a writing prompt. The common application has already posted this year's essay prompts, actually did that in January, to give students plenty of time to think about the essays. There are seven choices. Read them well before the application is due, mull them over, and choose the one that resonates the most. Some colleges may also ask for a graded paper. If you have a graded paper of which you're particularly proud, 
you might want to consider submitting that if asked. Keep track of it. If you do not have one you're excited about, now might be a really good time to write that paper for maybe your next writing assignment. We hope the information um, we've recommended has been really helpful and shows a little bit about the planning and the, how you can provide colleges with a snapshot of your best self. Let me turn it back to Andrew now and see if we can answer some of your questions. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, and we are ready for some questions. So um, we certainly won't be able to get to every question this evening, but uh, as a reminder, if you do have questions for our panel, please use the Q&A box um, and we will get to as many as possible. Um, please think about questions that really apply across the board to liberal arts colleges, to our six colleges, um, individual questions we just won't be able to get to tonight, but we do encourage you to go to our website, to reach out to us individually and participate in some of our programming. So first, first question is for Adam, um, and this is kind of a two-parter question, Adam. Um, how do you help students who enter your colleges um, who are undecided about their majors, and if a student has a lot of different interests, um, how do you go about at our colleges declaring your major, um, and when does it actually occur? Okay, this is a great question. This is one that is close to my heart, and one of the reasons I enjoy working at the sort of institution I work at. So, Andrew, I'm actually going to reverse it and take the second one first, but I promise you I'll get there. And if I don't, Andrew, I trust you'll say, uh, what about that second part? So first of all, I think our guests should note tonight that like we mandate uh, a pause between enrollment and when you can actually declare a major. You can't do that until the end of your second year. By design, no matter how much you feel in your DNA that you want to be a biologist, that was a that was a pun. It was done deliberately just to make your uh, Tuesday more exciting. Um, uh, that's fine. You can do that, but we will not let you put pen to paper until the end of your second year. Partly that's about general curriculum preparation. We want you thinking not just within a discipline, but across discipline. But also we find many people need time and distance to sort of really assess what their interests are at both a personal and academic level. Uh, high school preparation may be excellent, but honestly, seeing it at the next level might actually inform your thinking and give you um, a better sense of self-direction, which I think all of our faculty and advisors would ask you to do. Um, it's also for that reason that I would actually say and come back to that first question, like we have a soft spot for students who are undecided. I mean, we are the institution for you because we're asking you to apply to a liberal arts curriculum broadly. Um, you will not just take a single area of study as a focus space in your area here. Um, in, in all of our cases, more than two thirds of the coursework you take will be beyond your major itself. Uh, and that's intentional, right? Uh, we like students who are trying to square impossible things. Like I really, 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 really wanna be a chemist, but I can't shake this religious concept that I learned in this class in high school. And I'll go back and explore that. And I wanna try and bridge that gap. That might be really hard, but there's a lot of hay to be made in trying to do that. And we think that makes you a really interesting and talented young person who's interested, accept challenges in the real world that aren't neatly as packaged in a single uh, disciplinary space itself. So Andrew, I hope I got there. Great questions. Thanks for asking everybody. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Second question is for Emily. How does the size of our institutions affect access to research opportunities, internships, perhaps networking? Um, and do those opportunities really match some of our larger peers? It's also a great question. And to echo what some of my colleagues said earlier, I think the size of our institutions actually is the benefit in these, in these realms. You will have faculty who get to know you incredibly well, who can help you find the internship that's the right fit for you, um, the research opportunity to work closely with, with a professor and produce your own research, whatever it might be that you're looking for. We have incredibly engaged alumni who are eager to give back to their alma maters um, and who are, are looking to facilitate the successful um, career aspirations of our students. So I think our size actually is a, a strong benefit when it comes to opportunities and, and finding those relationships that can be great advising pathways to what you're looking for as a student. Um, I think it's actually a, a strong benefit. Great, thanks so much, Emily. <clears throat> Third question is for Solgi. What would you say that these colleges, um, or how would you say these colleges foster friendships among our student body, right? Is there a welcoming environment at our colleges? And is it easy to meet new people in college? 
Absolutely. Um, one thing that I heard a current student say is they were talking to a good friend who goes to a much larger university. And in that conversation, that other friend said, hey, how, you go to a small school, how come you know so many people? I think um, it's really common for our students to have large and um, really diverse friends across subject, subject areas, um, across clubs and activities. Uh, we all do uh, a lot to uh, create those opportunities to make connections with people from the get-go through orientation, through really intentional living communities, um, by designing a curriculum in a way that allows you to interact with people across disciplines throughout the four years. And so ironically, you may end up with more friends, more friends from different backgrounds and interests than a peer who goes to a much larger school who might be navigating that much larger school with you know, close-knit but very small group of friends. I think it's um, really easy to make friends also because the students who come to our institutions are looking for that environment that is open, um, that is welcoming, and uh, in the same way that they're looking for um, a lot of sort of exposure and experience in their curriculum, they're also looking for that kind of uh, variety and diversity in their friendships as well. Great, thanks so much, Solgi. Uh, next question is for Joel. Are there opportunities to study abroad at our six colleges? And if so, what are they like? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think I can safely say that all six of our institutions very firmly believe in the value of studying abroad. Um, that it is, we, I think all of us agree that we see it as, as an experience that is um, allows you to immerse yourself in a place, in a culture, and a, and a uh, area of the world that is different from where you are. Um, so all of us think encourage that as part of our uh, as part of our curriculum, um, giving you the chance to study abroad. To if you're going abroad through any of our programs, um, those credits are going to transfer back. They're going to count towards graduation. You're not going to lose ground uh, on your way towards your being you know to, towards being done in four years. Um, I'm going to guess that almost all of our programs that are taught in a uh, in a country where English is not the language of instruction will expect you to have some knowledge of that country's language in order to study there. Um, so whether that means speaking Spanish in Madrid, or it means speaking um, Mandarin if you're going to Beijing, immersing yourself in, and I think um, pushing yourself in foreign language study at our institutions can set you up very well to spend a semester or a summer or perhaps even an academic year abroad somewhere. Hey, thanks so much, Joel. <clears throat> uh, next question is for Kate. What is the STEM experience, a science, technology, engineering, mathematics um, experience like at our liberal arts colleges? And why might one study STEM at a liberal arts college? That's a great question. And that's one of my favorite questions. Oh, these are all my favorite questions. <laughs> um, so liberal arts college doesn't say liberal STEM college, right? It says liberal arts college. So is this a place where you can do science and math and engineering, et cetera? And absolutely it is. I think one of the advantages of small liberal arts colleges such as ours is you are actually the person who's doing the research alongside the faculty member. Our faculty are engaged in research and this is true across the curriculum, but I'm sticking with STEM right now. And they can't run their labs without our students. And so it really gives you excellent hand on hands experience. And if you were at a larger university, you could probably get it, but it might be harder because they're graduate students who are helping the faculty out, the, the primary investigators, um, probably at the first line. You might be working for a graduate student, but at our schools, you'll be working one on one with the faculty. And then uh, during your senior year, you would probably have the opportunity, if you chose to do so, to do a branch of the research the faculty is doing and go off on your own and do your own original research in the form of a senior thesis. We all have known students who have um, co-presented at national forums and national um, conferences with faculty members talking about the researches, the research they've done. So even though we're liberal arts colleges, the research opportunities as an undergraduate institution exclusively are really extraordinary. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, <clears throat> next question is for Emily. Can you please speak to some, some of the income or socioeconomic diversity at our collective colleges? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, each of our schools believes firmly that 
talented students that want to come join our campuses should be able to do so. Um, and that affordability should not be a hindrance to any student joining our community. You see that in our student aid practices and policies and our commitment uh, to how we award need-based financial aid um, and how we admit students without regard um, in our need in our need blind admissions practices. Uh, there's continued work to do. We all have continued work to do to make sure that students and families know that we can be an affordable and accessible choice for students from a variety of eco uh, economic backgrounds um, and that every student understands that we want uh, you, if you're admitted to our college, to be able to afford to come because it's important that our student bodies reflect the economic diversity of the world. Uh, we have students with many resources on our campuses and we have students who um, have much more limited financial resources at home um, and each of our schools is really working and every school has its own initiatives and programs but just collectively speaking to ensure that students know we can be an accessible choice and we want you to engage with us on this topic so it's really important to us that the cost of any of our educations is not a barrier to a student joining us Great, thanks, Emily. Uh, next question is for Adam. Are students at liberal arts colleges more likely to stand out um, for the graduate school admissions process? So undergraduate focused liberal arts colleges, good jumping off points for those who intend to apply to graduate programs in the future? Yes, and I really mean it, yes. Like, I think that this is true because I think one of the things our colleges ask you to do is in the curriculum itself, you'll be doing actual research um, from entry level first and second year, getting your bearings in a particular discipline all the way out through a sort of senior year work where you're, whether you know it or not, are doing independent graduate preparatory research on its own. That's true in sort of the STEM fields itself, and it's definitely true in the humanities where we can really incubate some, some skills and competencies that open up whole avenues of investigation for you. I think where students really shine in the entrance pool to graduate school in STEM or um, in non-STEM fields in the humanities and social sciences is in the sense of self-ownership and self-direction that our graduates bring to bear in that process itself. It sounds wishy-washy, but I think you'd be amazed how many um, graduates say, I have X degree from Y institution, I'm ready to go. Our students are able to say, I'm interested in this, I had these per pertinent questions at the edges of that, and I have this research to back that up. Uh, our grads are ready with that conversation because they've already been having it for years before they approach that. So you'll find that if you look at where our graduates go for graduate school, uh, it is all of the institutions you've heard of, many more beyond it, and it is national and international in scope. Uh, graduate schools know the names of our institutions. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Solgi, next question. How does a liberal arts curriculum affect one's future career? And is it more beneficial to go to a liberal arts college um, if we're thinking about kind of career developments and these sorts of things? Yeah, um, first off the bat, I'll just say that uh, you can probably get to any career destination regardless of the kind of college you attend. Um, but the six of us think that liberal arts colleges are exceptional opportunities um, because there's a lot of individualized attention uh, in the classroom and beyond. There's a lot of individualized career counseling. Um, and we are schools where you're really encouraged to explore deeply, to explore ideas, to explore yourself. Um, and in that process, we think through the classroom, through the career exploration opportunities we provide, we think you'll leave with a really strong sense of self and, and a lot of self-knowledge. Um, and so we hope that that will allow you to then have a, a really clear sense of the direction you want to go to after college. Now, practically, uh, uh, you heard us talk earlier that uh, nearly all of our graduates are employed in graduate school or pursuing service opportunities within six months of graduation. So our graduates have incredible success uh, gaining graduate school admissions, um, gaining really coveted job opportunities after college. Uh, we facilitate that by creating internship opportunities in your time in college, but also really helping you become a strong um, critical thinker, an excellent communicator, a strong writer, all qualities that in addition to the on the job knowledge that you'll develop over time uh, will allow you to be successful in whatever field you pursue. Now, for those of you who want more details and statistics, uh, each of our college websites will have on our Career Center website 
lots of really good information about med schools and 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 um, career uh, destinations that uh, our graduates have gone off to. So please uh, do your own research too. Just don't take our word for it. Um, but I really think that uh, for all the reasons why you might choose a liberal arts college for the in-classroom experience, uh, we have incredible outcomes as well. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I think uh, we offer incredible resources too. Great, thank you so much, Solgi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh my gosh. Uh, next question um, is for uh, Kate. Um, how many opportunities are there to learn to learn subjects and classes outside of our given major at our six colleges? That's a great question. Um, so another advantage, yet again, <laughs> of, of liberal arts colleges and our six colleges is. I think as Solvi uh, said in the very beginning, there's a lot of learning that takes place outside of the classroom in our communities, but there's also a lot of learning that takes place inside of the classroom, outside of your major. So we really want our students to graduate with a well-rounded education that will prepare them to think analytically about any number of topics and topics that we can't even conceive of today that we might not think about for eight, you know, eight or 10 years from now. So we want students to be prepared to think about that. And in order to be prepared, one has to be well-educated across disciplines. You will have a faculty advisor that will reach out and uh, reach out to you and do everything they possibly can to encourage you to take a broad range of classes and make sure you're meeting either institutional requirements, distribution requirements, core requirements, division requirements, um, and or just get a really solid education in a lot of different areas. We are not pre-professional. So students, even though they might have a passion for one particular area, um, I'll say math, for example, they also, after talking to the faculty advisor, will recognize that it's really important that they do take classes in English or other classes in the humanities in order to be balanced. Because no matter what your field is, if you're in, in a field with English, it's probably a good idea to have a sense of, let's say statistics, or if you're taking math, you should understand art or there are what, you know, any number of examples. So there's a lot of opportunity and encouragement. And you'll talk to friends who are taking classes and they'll say, oh my gosh, you've got to take a class from this professor, right? And so naturally you will branch out and take classes from areas that you wouldn't have dreamed of taking um, perhaps when you were in high school, but in college you're doing it because it's a very different kind of setting. So that is really encouraged. And I think oftentimes those classes end up being really fun classes that students remember for a long time. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, next question is for Joel. How can I find, and this is a student asking obviously, how can I find out what my family might be expected to pay at your six schools? Yeah, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, any school that's accepting federal financial aid or provides federal financial aid, um, has to include a net price calculator on its website. Um, and so if you go to any of our websites and type in the words net price calculator, um, it ought to come up pretty quickly. Uh, and that's a great place uh, for any for our institution, for any school like ours, for any, basically any school in the United States uh, to start digging into what kinds of financial aid offerings or what kind of things you could expect to pay at a particular institution. Um, but as I answered a, in a chat question earlier, um, that data is only as good as the data that you provide. Um, so make sure you've got all the required forms and things in front of you as you get started, because it, they can be a little intense uh, and, and, and pretty um, deep, um, but make sure that you um, are putting in good numbers and you should get good answers back. Um, and the other one that I mentioned is, uh, again, is myintuition.org, um, which is a, uh, an, a website that works with, it's, it's a much smaller group of institutions, um, but it brings that long financial aid questionnaire down to six questions at the most, um, and then uses that to provide sort of information on a range of, uh, of financial aid things that you might, ex you might expect to receive at a particular uh, institution. So um, for some of our schools, that might be a good place to start as well, because again, it, it, is, it maxes out at six questions, so a little, little, uh, little quicker to get through. Excellent. Thanks, Joel. Next question for Emily. In what ways do liberal arts schools tend to assist students both mentally and physically? Hmm. I appreciate the thinking that went into this question from the audience member. Thank you for that. 
Uh, all of our colleges, and, and this really echoes a lot of what my colleagues have said this evening, we're entirely focused on the undergraduate student. And so that is not just the learning that takes place in the classroom or in the residence hall or on the quad, all of our beautiful campuses behind each of us. Um, it's what the entire experience is centered on. It's growing as a person, um, being uh, engaged uh, physically and in, in body and movement. And so you can see this pragmatically through the supports and resources we have on our campuses, things like counseling centers and student health and wellness centers and club recreational sports, as well as division three athletics. Um, but you can also see it in the, the spirit of the place. We are places where people come and engage deeply in this highly residential experience where they get to know so much more about themselves, but also the world around them. Um, and I think that just really brings together all of the threads that what, what we've been talking about about this evening. Excellent. Thank you. We are now going to shift gears a little bit and focus a lot more on admissions and, and some financial aid related questions because there's a lot of questions about admissions and we understand that you have a lot of questions for us. So uh, first of all is Adam, could you describe um, our process when we are actually vetting each application? What are some characteristics of students you love to admit when considering their applications? I should be better ready for this than where I'm at right now. So you're gonna get me in my slightly unfarnished best, everybody, but I'll do my best, okay? So um, my sense here is a little bit of everything works. Um, I think we are interested in consciously doing justice to our huge and impressive and talented applicant pools, making sure we're reflecting some of those interesting ambitions and accomplishments and life stories in our incoming class. And we also wanna do justice to individual applications themselves. I think candidates who have really spent time identifying what is important to them and finding ways to convey that through these sort of mandatory and sometimes additional elements they can put forth in an application really shines. I guess that's my way of saying authenticity and, and self-reflection uh, really help distinguish many qualified applicants from each other. Uh, I, I think we're interested in people who sort of map to residential spaces. Obviously, we place a premium on that, but I think we're interested in people who are, are looking at that as a critical space in which they can sort of take the next step. We're not asking you to be finished products at age 18. Goodness knows none of us were, and I think none of us are right now, but um, we're just some people who've taken stock of where they're at and have done some thinking about where the next steps lie. If you want to be in the company of people who are interested in, in, in that same journey and are taking that, we're consciously building classes like that. So I'll start with that. I don't know what my colleagues have to say. Great, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, next is for Kate. For a student applying with an art portfolio, arts, performing arts, visual arts, creative writing, that sort of thing, um, is there any specific preference or guidance you might have for a successful portfolio or how does it kind of work at our colleges? Thank you for that question. Um, so I have very specific advice. And this is true for each of our colleges. Are you ready? Check our websites <laughs> and see what we're each asking because we're all going to ask for different for different things. Um, and some some colleges might want slides, some might want videos, some might not accept videos. So it really depends on what the college is prepared um, and set up to review. What happens at many colleges, however, is when you submit a portfolio, let's say music or, or art, it's not usually the admission officers who are the ones evaluating your talent. And in my case, that's a good thing. <laughs> it's, it's our faculty who are, who are evalu evaluating your talent, seeing how that talent fits into the program at the school. So if you're applying to a school and you have an extraordinary talent in name an instrument, oh my gosh, the fife, right? And it ends up that school has an incredible fife program. That's gonna be great if you're a good fife player, but if they don't have fife players, that might be a little bit less relevant. It doesn't mean that you would, that wouldn't be something that's really attractive to the school. It shows a huge commitment to that musical talent, but it might not be the same kind of match. Um, you had mentioned creative writing. Again, look, what, look at what the colleges offer. Um, if they want poetry or if they want um, you know, stories or if they want 500 words or 5,000 words. So just look at what the different colleges ask for. But we're all excited about your talents and your passions. 
So if you're submitting something, and even if we don't have that particular program, we really, we really are excited that you have something that you're very interested in, you've pursued um, so deeply that you want to continue thinking about this in college. Excellent, Kate. All right, really big question right now. There are so many questions about this in our Q&A, and this one is for Sulgi. So Sulgi, thanks so much for taking this one. Uh, if schools are test optional, do you have advice regarding submitting scores, and will we be test optional for the upcoming year? Yeah, so I'll answer the second part of that question first. Um, I've confirmed with my colleagues that we will all in this next admission cycle have test optional admission policies. Uh, and whether or not you submit testing um, is really entirely up to you. What I can say with absolute conviction is that when we say test optional, uh, we truly mean test optional. Uh, if you submit your test scores, uh, we'll consider them as part of a holistic process along with everything else in your application, your transcript, your course selection, your grades, your recommendations, your co-curriculars, your essays, everything that you submit. And if you choose not to submit your standardized test scores, or if you don't have any to submit, then we'll review the rest of the application without those test scores. So, you know, one question you might ask yourself is, uh, do my test scores um, align with the rest of my application? Maybe perhaps enhance my application, or do I feel like the other parts of my application are stronger than my test scores? But that's a question that, that you each will have to answer for yourselves. Maybe you can talk to your school counselor. Um, but what I really want you to hear is that uh, we are truly test optional. You will not be disadvantaged if you do not submit test scores, either because you don't have them or you choose not to, even if you do. Excellent, thank you so much, Sogi. Uh, next question, and we understand that this is a really specific question, but this one is for Joel. How do these colleges, our six colleges, provide financial aid for undocumented students or refugees or asylees or international students? And I know it's super specific, but what is our message to those students? Yeah, I think the important thing is to note that all of our institutions accept those students uh, and, and admit those students into our entering classes. Um, so I think that's probably the, the, the most important thing to note. Um, and then all of us are going to provide aid and how that aid is provided, what kind of aid is provided, how much, and, and, and who, that, that's going to be, again, very school specific and something you should consult the individual institutions uh, you're interested, you consult those schools directly. Um, but it is important, I think, for us to just note up, up front that those are all students. We admit all of those kinds of students. Um, we uh, see them as valuable members of our, of our entering cohorts. Um, and do everything we can to be supportive of them and to make sure that we're we're funding them appropriately. Excellent, thank you. Um, Emily, does a GPA really matter? There's such a difference amongst high schools across the country, around the world. How does it work when we're actually looking at the applications? Thanks, Andrew. It would be impossible for us to compare one number that's a GPA from one student to another number that's a GPA from another student. There are so many different, um, to, to Andrew's point, uh, curricula and grading scales and practices in high schools all across the United States, let alone the world. Um, so what we're doing as part of our holistic admissions practices is we're looking at your actual transcript. We're looking at your academic performance. We're looking at your course selection. Each of our processes is slightly different, but on the whole, what we're trying to see is how have you done with what's available to you in your school, in your, in your community, um, what choices where you've had room to make choice have you made, and how have you performed. Um, so it's much more a story of your academic record and progress and growth and challenge as it is um, than a, a number uh, on a piece of paper. Excellent. Thanks, Emily. Uh, next is for Adam. Can you, and this might be a little school specific too, but can you speak about demonstrated interest? Maybe define that, Adam, first for, for everyone. Um, do you place a greater weight on those who can get to our campuses for in-person tours versus virtual? Uh, it's a great question, and I think it's one that's going to vary a little bit uh, in the broader landscape of higher education. But I think one of the reasons we enjoy 
working together is that I think we have some fundamental questions about this. So I'll spell it out. Demonstrated interest is sort of the industry term for the ways in which prospective students engage with institutions to sort of register their prospective interest in enrolling in that institution if they were to be admitted. In other words, it's a way to sort of map your interest on an institution and hope that the institution notices it. Can we track all of that on our side? Yeah, yeah, we can. We all have uh, CRMs in place that enable that, but I think uh, we have all raised fundamental questions about what I would call equity in that space right now. Um, I am delighted to call Minnesota home right now. Minnesota may not be very close to where you live right now, and it seems un unfair uh, to ask you to hop on a plane to come visit for a place that may not ultimately admit you. And I think we've really leaned into that sort of way of thinking as a collection of six institutions. There are certainly ways to make fantastic decisions about how you map to each of these six colleges based on research that does not involve formal engagement with all of our admissions um, sort of offerings. You don't need to do all of that stuff. I think we would expect you to know something about our institutions that generally shows up in the strongest applications we have, but that can be done passively as well. It is not an expectation that you have to do that in this work in general. So that's where I think I would leave this for now and the precious minutes we have available to us. Great, thanks so much. Uh, Kate, when we're looking at extracurricular activities, the student spends a lot of time working and helping their parents and siblings, and they're wondering, does that count? 100% yes, for each of us. Um, what, what you're doing with your time outside of the classroom, whether it's a club in school, a varsity sport, a job, helping siblings, parents, grandparents, volunteering, is all using your time very productively. So please, if you need to work and, and you're doing that instead of doing something in school, um, that is not a disadvantage. And, it, and actually it shows an incredible commitment. So please don't for a second think that's a dis disadvantage. Um, People have, there are a lot of, a lot of different um, pressures that students have, and we recognize that and, um, and appreciate what you're doing and, and do take that into account and recognize the maturity um, and the sacrifice it takes to, um, to help out in a variety of different ways that might not be as traditional as some other students have the ability to do. Excellent, thanks so much. We have a couple of minutes left, and so I wanted to do a little bit of rapid fire in our final few moments here. Um, we have a lot of questions around um, students asking questions about support that we all provide for students with disabilities that might be learning disabilities, it might be um, other uh, physical disabilities, for example, we all collectively offer that type of support. So I'm here to say um, some of this is gonna be a little bit more specific to each institution. So we encourage you to go to our websites, meet with our disability services offices, ask those questions, those are really important questions. We won't be able to go around and answer those for you, but we do have several questions in the chat. So I wanted to mention that. Um, Another one that is pretty popular that we won't be able to answer as, as much is Division Three Athletics. We offer Division Three Athletics um, at our six colleges. Um, we encourage anyone who's interested in pursuing Division Three Athletics to go to the coaches directly, go to our athletic websites and reach out. Um, and each coach will have different ways that you can submit information to them um, and get noticed by them. Um, and so please go to the coaches directly. Um, and then finally, a lot of questions around interviews. We don't all offer interviews in the admissions process. This is a really specific question too. Uh, some of us do, some of it's, it's more optional. Um, and so what we encourage you to do, just like any of the questions that have really specific things um, around each of our processes, processes, is to go to our websites. And that's what I'm, I'm going to encourage you to do now. Um, you know, we have uh, exhausted our time together. Um, and that is all that we have for questions tonight. I hope that we have answered a ton of your questions. I, I, last time I looked, we had 73 open questions and 700 students attending. And so it's really difficult to get to all of those. Um, but um, we know that you have additional questions, um, new ones as you continue your, your journey toward college. We encourage you to reach out to our institutions, visit our websites and social media channels, participate in virtual and on-campus programming to the extent that you can and ask lots of questions. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's program. We hope that you will also join us for future programs. Please visit sixcolleges.org. I'd like to thank my colleagues for um, their time and effort and enthusiasm this evening. Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening and please stay safe.